Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to all the organizations and foundations that have supported this research and the National Press Club. It's a great honor uh, to be asked to present uh, in this, uh, this sponsored event. Um, the last time I was here in D.C., I was presenting on graduation rates and racial disparities before uh, the National Academy of Education and the National Research Council. And one of the things that I was testifying to them about was the connection between the use, the high use of suspensions and the racial disparities in suspensions for minor offenses and how that's a leading indicator we know from research to dropping out and future incarceration. And their recommendations around graduation rates also now address the need to look at suspension data. And so there is a sort of growing consensus among researchers because we know uh, quite clearly now uh, from the National uh, Council of uh, State Governments report, uh, studies from Johns Hopkins University and others, that one of the leading indicators of whether students are going to drop out or wind up incarcerated is whether they were suspended uh, when they were in middle school or in high school. And just as it was once very difficult to get accurate information on graduation rates, currently it is really hard to get accurate information broken down by race and disability status, broken down by types of offenses on school suspensions. This is information that is not nationally reported on an annual basis for all the different subgroups in a way that's really useful to policymakers and parents. So <clears throat> we know about the connection. We know that now there's, it's not just about a safety issue, really, it's, an ac it's, a, it's a question of the academic health of our middle schools and high schools, whether they're suspending huge numbers of students, uh, especially for minor offenses. So with that knowledge, one of the things that I had done previously to this report is looked at middle school suspension rates and used the OCR data uh, in a sort of more advanced form to break it down by middle schools and found out that, at least in the 2006 data, over 28 percent of black males were, were suspended out of school at least one time. And these are very conservative estimates. So when you look at this data down at the, at the state and district level, the numbers get higher and higher and higher. So we were finding many middle schools and many urban districts where more than 50 percent of black males, black females, uh, different subgroups were being suspended out of school at least one time. It's a tremendous loss of instructional time. The racial disparities broken down by race with disability are quite pronounced. And this is another area where there is some state level reporting, but not a lot of information available to the public. But we were able, from another source, from Office for Special Education Programs, collects data here and found that in some states, statewide, over a third of the black children with disabilities were being suspended out of school at least one time, and less than 7 percent of the white students with disabilities. So huge disparities. These are the children that really need to have uh, behavioral assessments and behavioral improvement plans in place. These are the children where we need to make, especially because they have a disability, extra efforts to make sure that they're staying in school. And uh, obviously, from that kind of data, that's not happening. So this is really important. When we do the rare times where we are able to glimpse the data further broken down by things like first-time offense, because people say, well, aren't the black students just misbehaving more? And we're seeing real clear evidence that there's bias, racial bias, disability bias, all kinds of bias that are maybe affecting these rates. So when you look, when you are able to get data on first-time offenses for some of these minor offense categories, for example, cell phone use in North Carolina, we had data there. For the first-time offense, for just having a cell phone, 32 percent of the black students were suspended out of school, only 14 and a half percent of the white students. Uh, for something like display of public affection, 42, almost 43 percent of the black students suspended out of school the first time this happened, only 14 percent, almost 15 percent of the white students. So these tremendous racial disparities, when we're looking at first-time offenders for minor offenses, uh, are just, they're, they're shocking. Unfortunately, uh, we're not getting this information on a regular basis. And this is where I think the press can really play an important role. Uh, all of you who are members of the journalistic core need to ask schools and school districts for this information. It's sort of the parents' right to know. We need to know this as policymakers, as members of the community, uh, really what's going on, especially because when we're suspending kids for these minor offenses, truancy is one of the leading reasons for suspending kids. Where is the deterrent 
value in suspending truant kids. It makes no sense. Another one is dress code violations. Well, the reason given, well, we're concerned about gang affiliation. So the answer is to send the student unsupervised out onto the street because you're worried about gang affiliation rather than either confiscating the, uh, the garment that's a violation or providing a, you know, a uniform or whatever it is that you need to do and keeping the kid in school. So we're really increasing the risk for, for delinquency and incarceration and gang affiliation by kicking these kids out. And there are groups like Fight Crime, Invest in Kids who represent police officers who will say the same thing. They are not liking what they're seeing with this really rapid increase. And the increase has been dramatic. In the early 70s, about 6% of black students, about 3% of white students K through 12 were being suspended out of school. Now it's 15% of black students, and that's K through 12, about 5% uh, of white students. So it's gone up for all students, but the, the racial disparities are tremendous. So this is really not, you know, we have to kick out the bad kids so the good kids can learn. That's a myth. That's sort of Joe Clark, uh, you know, and that didn't work. It didn't work in Pennsylvania and the, the school he taught at. It does not work. In fact, the research shows that when um, principals who have clear expectations and enforce rules uh, strictly but have a mission of keeping kids in school, so their first response is not to suspend out of school but to take some disciplinary action in school, those, those kinds of schools have higher test scores uh, and lower suspension rates than similar when you control for demographics, all the things you can control for, compared to similar principles but who blame the parents, blame the students, think that you have to punish, uh, you know, first time you're out, we have to be really strict in a way that is pushing kids out of school. Those schools have lower test scores. So that's based on studies of statewide studies in Indiana as well as supported by rec more recent studies of Texas, where they had they did longitudinal study of all the students uh, in middle schools in Texas for over six years. They tracked these students um, and saw what happened. And, and in fact, most of them, um, the majority of students in Texas, were suspended or had a disciplinary removal from a classroom um, within between grades seven and twelve. So it's really that what people don't realize, they hear kids being suspended, they think, oh, they punched a teacher or, or they brought a gun to school. In fact, most of the kinds of uh, offenses we're talking about are these minor violations, and all the research will support that. When you break it down by why are kids being suspended, we're seeing it's predominantly uh, minor infractions that don't require uh, law enforcement, haven't, kids haven't violated a crime, there's no violence involved, no, il no illegal drugs or, or guns or anything like that. So basically this is a myth busted, the idea we have to kick out the bad kids so the good kids can learn. That is a myth busted. The research supports that this is an educationally unsound policy and practice. Another thing is that there, the research also says that there's a lot to replace this with. There are school-wide positive behavioral interventions and supports. There's uh, training for classroom teachers. Uh, afterwards I can tell you more about my own experience. I taught for 10 years. The first year I, was a, I wasn't suspending kids, but I was sending them to the principal's office. I had a wise principal. She didn't suspend them, thank God. But anyhow, I'll get into more of that if you like. Um, the idea that you're going to deter future misbehavior, not only are there issues, like I mentioned, around truancy, but other studies that show when kids who are suspended once early in middle school, that's the leading indicator they'll be suspended again in seventh grade and eighth grade. And these schools where they are suspending a lot of kids, what we're seeing is it grows from sixth grade. The numbers practically double by ninth grade. So, in other words, the peers. These are these are data looking at one one kid suspended one time. So, kids who are repeatedly suspended aren't re reflected. So, we're seeing that the the numbers of children that are suspended are increasing, not decreasing. So, the idea that we're going to scare them straight and get them all to behave, it's not working. It's not working as a deterrent. So, it's not hitting the mark. It's an un, there's no research whatsoever really to support this kind of uh, uh, overuse of suspension or, or get tough on kids kind of policy. Um, <clears throat> so we have this unjustifiable, uh, unjustifiable policy. It has a dramatic disparate impact on youths of color. Um, we have less discriminatory alternatives. We have uh, training classroom management. We have positive behavioral interventions and support. So this is also a civil rights issue. When you have those things, it really behooves the educators to change their policy and practice. And it is an issue of, for civil rights enforcement. Unfortunately, one new development is the Department of Justice and Office for Civil Rights are saying they're going to uh, get, give guidance to schools on this topic. 
and they're going to start to enforce civil rights, Title VI in particular, with regard to school discipline. So we hope to see more of that. Um, so to sum up in terms of policy recommendations, one of the things that we need to do is routinely collect, analyze, and publicly report school disciplinary removal at the state, district, and school levels. And this should be part of how we evaluate school and district performance. It shouldn't be relegated to some back issue around safety. This is a core educational issue because it's one of the leading indicators of whether kids drop out. We need greater federal support for school-wide systems of positive behavioral interventions and support. <clears throat> and there are a number of bills pending in Congress that would, just, would do just that, provide more su support for these kinds of programs. We also have to provide incentives to ensure that teachers and leaders develop more effective skills in classroom and behavioral management. Um, namely, one, I just want to reiterate one point. We have to end what um, I call the Pledge of Illusions. And I take that from when my uh, son came back from his first day of kindergarten. He said, Daddy, today I learned the Pledge of Illusions. So I said, I have to work that into. And this Pledge of Illusions is when we're not getting this information. And so you, as members of the press corps, can really help all of us in the public really exercise this right to know what's going on in schools. So ask schools and districts, what are their suspension rates? Not just for the worst offenses, not just for the gun-toting use and the kids who brought drugs, but we want to know how many kids are you suspending for truancy? How many for dress code violations? We need this data broken down by race, by disability status. Parents need to know this because we also know from the research there's lots of schools that are doing it right. It, with the same demographics, there are schools that are suspending far fewer kids and getting better uh, graduation rates, getting better test scores. And we need that information so that we can identify both where things are going well as well as the places where they need more support. So I'll, I'll leave with that. I have a number of other things that I can tell you, but I'll, I want to give uh, there are a number of uh, really important panelists to come. So thank you very much. Questions? African-American students were being disparately treated was because they were indeed behaving badly more often. So I wondered if you could just speak to that, if you have any empirical research yourself. Yeah, is this addressed to Dan to Lozen? Dan, largely, yeah. <coughs> well, the truth is there's really no empirical evidence to support that. So one of the issues, though, is that we know from the, the data we do have, there's a strong indication that there's bias, racial bias, bias against students with disabilities that come into play. When you see for the same first time offenses, what kinds of punishments are meted out. And the fact that wherever we get the data, we see the same kind of breakout where black students, often Latino students, are for the first time they commit an offense, are getting out of school suspensions and white students are getting in school suspensions or a slap on the hand or something minor. So th that's part of the problem. There's, it's very difficult to set up somehow uh, an independent observer in a classroom to say, here are the behaviors, here are the students that misbehaved, here's the frequency of misbehavior, and here are the, co here are the consequences that were meted out. So you always have this non-objective, very subjective uh, person in the classroom who, who is, you know, to one person they see roughhousing, another person it's an assault. Um, so that's part of the problem with the, in terms of the research. But where we do have research, we see these tremendous disparities. But the other part of this is that, as, as we've heard from the other panelists and the research, most of these suspensions are things for truancy, dress code violations, uh, tardiness, all kinds of minor misbehaviors for which edu kicking kids out onto the street is an educationally unsound practice. So let's just assume for argument's sake that black students were misbehaving more. If you took the medical model that black students were more prone to certain illness, but you knew a certain medicine was not working, in fact, was detrimental, you wouldn't keep giving that same medicine to black students just because they were more likely to be ill. It doesn't make sense if it's an unsound educational policy. It doesn't work for deterrence reasons. 
We've heard it doesn't work for safety. In fact, and there are less discriminatory alternatives. There are ways that teachers can get support. Uh, there are pos systemic, you know, positive behavioral interventions and support systems that really do work, reduce suspension rates, keep kids in school, improve graduation rates, improve grades. So in that context, it really makes no sense to be continuing to continue to keep kids out, kick kids out of school. Uh, and and it, so there's really, there is a, a fundamental civil rights problem here. Um, so I think that's, that's, you know, that's the context we have to think about this, uh, this, this whole problem. I'm Frank Lockwood. I'm with the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. Uh, it was my belief that at least theoretically, if somebody had a disability, and if their behavior was a manifestation of their disability, that you could not punish them for their disability. And what I'm wondering is, how is it that we're seeing such high uh, punishment rates for students with disabilities? So I'm glad you asked that question, because there's a sort of a, a misunderstanding that kids with disabilities, that there's some sort of double standard and they have it easier. In fact. The, the rule is if you are going to suspend a student for more than 10 days, that you have to provide a manifestation determination hearing. And at that hearing, it's the, there are two questions that are often asked. Usually they only ask the first one, which is whether or not the misconduct was a manifestation of the student's disability. Oftentimes they'll say, no, the student knows right from wrong. OK, so we're going to suspend them long term. Um, the other question that often is not asked is whether the IEP was being properly implemented, whether the student's behavioral improvement plan was being properly uh, supported and provided for. And the qu if that answer is no and there's a linkage to the misbehavior, then that student shouldn't be uh, suspended out of school for more than 10 days. But what the data I cited was for suspensions of less than 10 days. And for those suspensions, there is no requirement of any kind of due process or manifestation determination, none of that. Uh, they're treated exactly like students without disabilities. And the vast number of suspensions for all kids are for less than 10 days. So that's why you see states like Nebraska, where 37% of the black students with disabilities were suspended at least one time in a given year, K through 12. I mean, these are incredibly high rates of short-term suspensions where kids are being, and the other thing they're supposed to do is see if it cumulatively adds up to t more than 10 days, and oftentimes that's not happening. Part of the problem is that there's no reporting of this data at, this, at the district or school level, so uh, we don't often have access to this information. Um, I do, again, urge journalists to ask for this information because it is collected, it has to be reported to the state, so through uh, state sunshine laws and through Freedom of Information Act requests, reporters can get this information if they ask the right questions. If I could follow up, is it problematic that there's only this civil rights protection for people with disabilities beyond 10 days? Is that 10 day window, is there any uh, ra common sense rationale to that? Well, the, there's, the, the common sense rationale really should be that all kids would have some sort of due process because we know the harmful effects of suspending a kid for one day and for lengthier periods of time it's even greater. And what the law also requires for kids with disabilities is if you're going to suspend them for more than 10 days, that's considered a change of their educational placement and they are required to provide those students with an education. And what we're hearing uh, from both the superintendent and from Judge Teske is that all kids, when they're going to be out of school for disciplinary reasons, should be provided with an education uh, in an alternative setting. And that's not, most state laws don't require alternative ed. Texas does, a number of states do, uh, but most do not. So really, to the extent that there is greater protection for kids with disabilities. It's be, partly it's because there's a long history of kicking kids with disabilities out of school. Um, and so the IDA uh, instituted this requirement that they have additional due process because you know there's this bias against kids with disabilities and wanting to get them out of the classroom. Another thing I'm concerned about is as we mainstream more kids, which is really important to do, the teachers don't get the kinds of supports they need in the classroom. So that's something I sometimes see in the data, oh, we're mainstreaming uh, our kids with disabilities, and then you find out, oh, their suspension rates are now through the roof. Um, so this is a really important issue. Uh, 
Right. Uh, the, there's a it's uh, there's a report, a full report online that uh, breaks it down by large school districts and the national data. Um, I didn't break it down. I don't believe state by state. Uh, but what we do, we are seeing uh, across the board is. 28%, uh, I think, 28.3% uh, for black males, and I believe white males was around 10%. I can, I, I have to double check that. It's in, it's in the report actually. Uh, so, um, so forgive me if I misquoted my own study. It's on the fact sheet. It's on the fact sheet as well. Um, but you know, this also points out the need to look at race and gender together because we're also seeing a rise when we looked at the middle school suspension rates. The group that was increasing, getting you know higher rates of suspension uh, between, I think we looked at four years apart at 18 school districts, was black females. So their rates are going, they, they were much lower and they're rising more than any other subgroup. So it's really important to look at some of the specific issues broken down by race and gender, race and disability status. Uh, and these inform this kind of information is collected. It's not as if schools don't collect the data. Uh, they just don't report it to the public on an annual basis.